up dropping this bottle at some point, so just set your alarm or countdown or something. Um, so my name is Sarah El Male. I am a voice actor uh, and regular actor, and I, but I mostly do video games. I moved out to Los Angeles to do video games. Um, I started out in theater in New York and then did a lot of indies, including Gone Home. Um, and since I've moved here um, to focus more on games of all sizes, I've done um, more AAA stuff, uh, including most recently Anthem, um, if that's from my Oh, oh cool. <laughs> Yay. So yeah, if you choose a lady in Anthem, that's me. Um, and I am joined by some extremely experienced and wonderful, gifted um, panelists who I will let introduce themselves. Thank you. Starting with America. Hi, um, I'm Maria Diaz. Um, I'm the voice of Stunts and Motion Capture in the Movie Review. And this year I was Stunts, not voiceover. <laughs> right here. <laughs> so to repeat, mainly stunts and motion capture, not voiceover. Um, and uh, this year I broke my 55th. Uh, title, uh, video game that I worked on. Hey, I'm Dee Bradley Baker. I uh, am a voice actor exclusively these days. I've been out here in Los Angeles for about, uh, I think, over 25 years. Um, started doing all kinds of different kinds of performing and eventually found my way out here and found that I like voiceovers the most. And I've done a fair amount of video games and lots and lots of TV shows and movies. It's all work. It's all fun for me. And um, I look forward to uh, talking about the specifics of, uh, of interactive or any other questions you guys have for us tonight. Cool. Um, so yes, please. <laughs> Dee is a legend. Um, and I, I'm very, very excited to have him here. And also, I, I'm just going to, before I even forget, Dee has a wonderful website um, called, and is it I Want to Be or I Want to Be? I Want to Be a Voice Actor.com. It's fantastic. It's extremely comprehensive. Whether you're Long winded. New, no, it's perfect. Informative. Yes. Informative. It's Thorough. free. <laughs> it's free. It's great. And if, if you're just getting started in voiceover, or even if you're just sort of looking to level up at any point in your career, it's really, it's, got, it's full of great advice. So write that one down. Um, so to get us started, I'm actually really curious about the, who's in this room right now and what your background is and your passion is. So um, if just by show of hands, um, who does mostly theater, for example, or has a background in theater? Nice. Okay, there we go. Background in theater, great. Cool, 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 cool. Um, and what about on-camera work? Okay. Wow. All right. And voiceover, specifically? All right, nice. This is a good mix. Okay. And who has experience, some experience in games already? Okay. And who plays video games? Hey! I love that. That's exciting That's to me. That's a good sign. That's so good. I wasn't always, sh like, I felt like sort of alone in that for a long time. I think that's shifting. I think that more and more of us coming in, especially with you folks, the next gen folks, um, are people who have firsthand experience with games. So all of this stuff will start to make sense to you. That's really exciting. You having kind of a familiarity with the format is great. And for those of you who don't, you can go on YouTube and look at things called Let's Plays. There's a lot of footage of people playing games. So if you don't find yourself you know, literate in using controllers or it's just not how you spend your time, which I totally get, they take a lot of your time, um, that you can go on YouTube and start to familiarize yourself with the context for what you're stepping into. Um, so cool, that's covered. So when it comes to performance capture, the, the reason I asked to start with this is because game voiceover or performing in games means a lot of different actual skills and trades and spe specializations. Um, so there's booth voiceover, which is very particular when it comes to video games. There's where you're by yourself most of the time, for example. Um, there's getting on, st on a motion capture set and needing to be fluent in your body. If you're doing full performance capture, it really comes down to combining those all three of those things. An on-camera face, a theater body, and a voiceover voice. So learning how to kind of think with all those, become kind of ambidextrous with all of those skills um, on a performance capture set specifically, that'll, that'll be your goal. Um, so to start... Theater actors do really well with that. Yeah. Anyone with theater training um, ha usually have the skills to do all of that at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes, so go to your, go to your schooling, <laughs> go, to your, go to your roots. Um, let's see. So how should we how should we dive in? How do we, how should we approach this? Should we have a an overview of it or of or, uh, we can? I mean, I was going to start by saying how we got in, or how how does okay. one get in, and then how did you get in? Okay. So how did you get in? <laughs> I'm trying to get out. <laughs> how do you to, get out? <laughs> how do I get out of, of voice acting? No. Um, I mean, uh, for me, when I started out, you just start 
I, I just started auditioning for anything that comes down the pike, which is commercials and TV shows, as well as video games. And I, and I started working in video games because I think partially I had the, the skill set, I had the ability with, uh, with language, although I'm not a trained actor. And I also really like video games. I understand them. I, 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 know, I know how gameplay should feel and how a performance works. I'm also familiar with the kinds of, uh, of popular storytelling that most all video games are derivative of in some way or another. And, um, I, and I, I also like monsters and, and uh, creatures as well. And so all of these fantastical things kind of wove together to make me something that I think works well in doing video games. Some people, some, some actors, some voice actors, they just don't want to. They don't like the way that, that you're by yourself all the time and it's four hours of solid work. They, uh, they, don't, they may not like that it's uh, really straining or, or even damaging to your, to your voice what you're asked to do. Uh, or they just don't like video games. They think they're silly and they're not really acting. And, and each of those is kind of an interesting thing to address, I think, uh, which we'll probably get to uh, this evening. But for me, I just, I like doing them. So, so it worked out for me. I think we all like doing them. Do we all yeah. like to? We great. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, I love doing um, them. I got into it because a stunt coordinator I was working with was also casting a video game and had me come out and audition. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Thankfully, there was someone at the audition who was able to kind of explain to me why this was different, which is using your entire body. Um, and as someone who tends to be way too expressive for on camera, uh, this was my spot. Like, this is where I felt right at home. I had a large theatrical tr background, um, and I oh, have always loved the visceral of uh, telling a story with your body. When I started, there wasn't much performance capture. It was very segmented. It was the voiceover actor, um, or the first title did actually was a Spider-Man game with Tobey Maguire. So it was Tobey Maguire. Two? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, <laughs> and then you have the motion capture body, and so they would kind of like lip syncing, but with your body. They would play the track, and that you would have to act out with your body what was actually being said. Um, so that was voice first, and then mm -hmm. that's unusual. Yeah, and then the body would come after. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's not because when you're doing animation for like a series, they lay down the voice track, and then they animate to the voice track we were animating um, by doing the motion capture to the voice. And that was so much fun because you have spectacular performers who are the best at what they do. And then you get to take what they give you and their nuances of their uh, voice and add that to a physical performance. And then you have the animators then on top of that who add on a whole nother layer of art and creation. And it just felt like you were part of Voltron. You know, like all these people who are the best at what they do, combining into the, the, the best performance that you could never have with just one person, or you would be challenged to find someone who could pull that off. So I really love doing that. This, is, this, this crowd knows what Voltron is. This is next gen, right? OK, good. Um. They just had one come out, so <laughs> yeah. I figured. Right, 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 it's current. Um, that's so interesting, um, not to get too far off or too deep into it early, but uh, I've had the opposite experience, right, of having motion capture. For For Honor, we had pre, you know, everyone had done motion capture already, and then I was um, voicing on top of that. And I like performance capture that I get to do kind of a fully integrated thing where it's my body and my voice all at the same time. But it was a special and a nice experience to have mocap actors bring so much energy. It was so inspiring. I mean, just seeing the, the on-set footage of their, of their passion and their embodiedness and just as a cue that I can kind of mimic and put myself, put my voice through. So it works. It's interesting to be inspired both ways, no matter which order that comes in. Um, for me, how did I get in, I guess? Um, I, I, did, I did a path of pursuing agent representation in New York. I was in the wrong city for a long time. <laughs> I was in the wrong city for a long time. And I loved, I loved New York, it's, it's amazing. There's rock stars there, there's a couple of places there, but mainly, but I knew kind of early on that I needed to be here. So you're in the right spot, is the answer. It was lucky for you guys um, to be here for a lot of AAA stuff. 
Um, and I started going to the game developer conference, which I would encourage people to go to if you can afford it. Um, not many actors kind of go to it. It's for developers. But I took it on myself to kind of get in the mix, learn more about game development as a thing, um, can, you know, network with folks there. I found that it was easy for me to meet indie devs and independent developers um, because they were casting their own projects as in kind of separately from the traditional voiceover pipeline. Um, so I kind of got my start doing stuff out of my home studio uh, in New York, doing that, and then also doing theater and everything else there. Then I moved here, and I'm, I'm with a wonderful agency here um, that gets sides as I'm blessed to kind of be in the mix now, finally, for, for projects like this um, in the kind of traditional mode with casting directors and other stuff. And so all my AAA stuff has worked out that way. But I would encourage you to see yourself as part of the game development process. I think that's, that's a move I would like to see everyone move into where we are all collaborators and part of this process and um, you know can are curious about and respectful of each other. Um, so that was how I did it. It's unconventional though. It's I don't know that it's necessary, but I found it enriching. And I think it informs my understanding of what's needed in the booth and on the set. I can translate for other for for Anthem I was translating for um, the other actors on the set being like, I'm a first person camera. This is what the player is going to experience. This is why there's different options, dialogue options in this scene. It's not just a straight convo the whole way through. What does that mean? So it kind of empowers you to help your castmates in some cases or make a session move very quickly. Um, so yeah. Moving on. Do you, speaking of agents, do you, does one need an agent to get into interactive work? Do you reckon? Um, I, I, I would only do it through my agent myself. They don't make very much money uh, through it. I mean, you know, we, you're probably just going to get a session fee out of it for your four hours worth of work. And for your agency to audition, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred people maybe, and spend the days recording and producing and, and, and maybe book one or two, maybe, they get a 10% of that. It's not a lot of not a lot of bang for the buck, as opposed to uh, like an animated series, for instance, where there's residuals in perpetuity, and they get something from that. So financially speaking, it's uh, it's not as favorable as other realms of voice acting, to be sure. But for me, I just like to have I I, I want my agent to deal with the the specifics and to make sure that it's. Um, that um, all the details are clear up front so I know what's coming down the pike. And, um, and to work out all the details and, and to have them have my back if I any kinds of issues come up, which occasionally that will happen on any gig, but, but sometimes in particular with interactive where it can be uh, quite straining and difficult. And if you, if you come at this at, at, uh, with a passive stance, you can, you can destroy your voice very quickly and not get them what they want, and it's not good for anybody. And so uh, that's part of what's uh, really important to me. What's really important is, uh, is to sort of actively engage with the, uh, uh, the recording process to move it along and to make it, to space things out and to not damage yourself so that you can get them what they need, get them, get them the goods. Um, I think to audition for voiceover, I think you have to have an agent to get those auditions unless you're meeting the developers directly and they're sending it to you. It's also a good way to filter through to make sure what you're getting is in fact union and that they're asking for the things that will protect you. Motion capture is a weird deal. Um, I do have a motion capture actor at Box, or uh, agent at Box, um, and they do send me auditions, and I usually will have them negotiate things for me, but I'm definitely at a different place where I have my relationships now directly with the developers, and so a lot of times that's just a direct call. But I think in another way motion capture is different is that it's an eight-hour day instead of a four-hour day, but a lot of the times as a voiceover actor, you get hired for the one role or maybe the two role or in Dee's case, the 30 roles of the game. But um, once you're brought on to the base core team for motion capture for a video game, you're playing all the characters. So I'll show up for a day and there'll be uh, five guys, two girls, and then we play all the characters. I am usually populate the entire game. And so it'll be weeks and weeks of work depending on what the title is. It's, I, I'm fascinated because I, I really don't know anything about mocap. 
Is that something you do like every day of the week or like once a couple days a week or how does that work? It depends on the title. I've worked every single day uh, for the week, Monday through Friday for three months at a time, um, like you would a feature. Uh, or you get called in for two days on this one particular thing because you're one specific character. I think it might be a little different for guys, for women, it's getting better. But for women, there's not as many roles. So um, usually there's less days for the women to work. But usually it's just a full day. You show up at eight, you get into your suit, and you're wrapped by five. That's the great thing about it, is that you, there's no OT. I mean, that's not great not to get paid OT. <laughs> but it's great in terms of it's nice to have a schedule. You know what to expect for your week when you're booked for the week. But yeah, you'll be booked for a week at a time, two weeks at a time. I've been worked on something for so months. So it's like being on a TV show or something where they own your schedule for whatever the duration of the shoot is. Yeah, oh. and it's the same rate as your four hours. Right, that's, that. yeah. There's two things we flagged here, one of which is the structure of the contracts, which you haven't had, if you haven't had a chance to, I would encourage you to be the kind of person who understands I barely understand the other contracts, so I'm talking out of turn, but looking at the game voiceover contracts and understanding how they shape your day. I mean, if, if that affects your work and what you're called in to do. So, I mean, if it's a four-hour session up to three voices, you should expect to do up to three different voices. And in games, that often means a more naturalistic style than an animation. So three different, not cartoony or stylized human beings that sound differentiated. So look at the contracts and think about what that means when you're going in. Understand what that money represents to yourself and to your, and how much you can devote energy and time to it. We do it out of love, more, really, um, and to your agent. Um, there is a low budget contract, which I will like put out there for just a second because I worked really hard on it and I'm really glad we have it, that does offer contingent compensation based on um, the success of the game. That's something that, that's, an, that's a whole other narrative of, of how the contracts have progressed over time um, to get you more money for what you do. Um, but the low budget one does have, based on this, the sales of the game, some secondary payment to you. And all motion capture is covered by the contract no matter what you're told by the publishers. And you will be told that it's not, and it is. It is 100% covered by the contract. And there are some major titles out there by major publishers who insist, insist that it's not covered, and it is. So please make sure you double check and triple check, um, because if it's not covered by, if, if you don't work a union contract, you're not protected. And I'm speaking specifically for motion capture and stunts. If you get hurt, you're not covered, you're not protected, there's no workman's comp, there's no hospital bills paid for you, and they wreck you on these shoots. So please make sure that you are only working a union contract for your own safety. I mean, you're not gonna get residuals, and you're not gonna, like, you're not doing it for any other reason but for your own physical safety. Yeah, the other, we could we can transition into vocal stress, I think, just safety. Let's do. As, let's shall we? <laughs> we'll, we've let's got too crunchy. We've let's got transition to vocal stress right so, now. Vocal stress. Um, yeah, no, we've done right. The contracts is one bit. Understand the contracts, and then vocal stress. It's a serious subject. Um, it's something that producers are learning about alongside of the union. The union has had a number of really excellent clinics on vocal stress um, alongside. Um, uh, I'm a dummy who can't think of the doctor name for who focuses on this. <laughs> Throat doctor. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Rina Gupta, she's amazing. Um, she knows her title. Uh, but yeah, so she, uh, th there's more research on what happens to your voice when you yell you know, at full volume for four hours straight or two hours straight as the case may be. Um, so learn about that stuff, take your warm up seriously. We can talk a little bit about what we do to condition ourselves once we get either into a booth or on a performance capture set. Um, but yeah, vocal stress is something that and, we're... And when you get hurt in motion capture, it's a lot easier to get your coverage because it's clear when you've got a bone sticking out of your shin, right? Um, vocal stress is so much harder because you are wrecked and there's, it's very hard to prove it. And it can affect your work for the rest of the week. And I know, thankfully, know very little bit about it, but the more I hear about it, the more insidious it sounds because it's really hard to prove your injury, which is why it's so important to make sure you take care of yourself um, and you stand up for yourself. Yeah, I mean, games, not all games, not all, you know, there's lots of different kinds of games and tones for games. Some games are goofy and for kids and sweet. Some games are totally conversational and just very easygoing. But many games do involve a lot of battle cries and yelling. Um, burned alive. Yeah. Burned alive, yeah, fire is Falling the traditional killer, right? Because it takes time, you're full of horror, you're, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun, it's also all fun, for me it's fun. 
Um, but it is something to, don't let the fun carry you away from your well-being, um, in, in, in either just because you're having a nice time or because you want to please them. Um, and yeah, they're at the clinic, I think they showed vid footage of like hemorrhage vocal cords and I like literally passed out. Like I walked around that corner and was like, <laughs> like I needed water. So it is, it can be invisible. It can sneak up on you. Um, so things like clearing your throat are great tells before you feel damage or like real fatigue or you start losing your voice. If you're starting to clear your throat, really good voice directors will take care of you and they'll, they'll know these tells and they'll communicate with you. I've had directors say, you're just gonna get two of these, no more. This is a death cry, one, go, that's it. That's all you get, even if you wanna do more. And that's great. Not all directors are at the same level of education though. So take it on yourself to pay attention to your voice, learn what you can about when it's starting to strain. Um, and, and feel confident communicating with your director about it, because no one actually wants to hurt you. No one wants you to, to you know, kill yourself for... To and even if they don't care if you're hurt... <laughs> they usually don't, but not let's just be, say they Not don't. to be jaded. Not to be jaded or cynical. But even if they don't care that they're hurt, they want you to finish the session. Right. So everything aside, standing up for yourself and saying, I need to take 10 minutes, or can I have 10 seconds between each line so that you can reset yourself or whatever it is, you probably have better advice than I do on this specific thing. It's but all good advice. They, they would prefer that you get through the session than you blow up your voice halfway through. Whether they care about you as a human or not, you're still the talent and they need you to finish your job. So always stand up for yourself. Right, what they, what they care about is they wanna get what they need. And you can frame the whole session that way when you go in. I mean, when I, when I go in, it, it's, it's often something that's gonna be vocally stressful, there's gonna be death, there's gonna be fighting, there's gonna be multiple variations of death and fighting. And, um, and that is kind of a given. And so you hopefully rely on your own experience as a live performer. And maybe you've had uh, some singing training or, or other, other kind of vocal training that shows you how to make the performance without damaging yourself with the most relaxed yet powerful kind of way. Then beyond that, um, I see it that we're brought in not as a, as a passive servant, but as a collaborator, as a specialist. Mm -hmm. And as such, it behooves us to discuss with them how this session is going to go so we can map out where the heavy lifting is in the session to maybe space that out a little bit if necessary. And then uh, there's also the matter of how many takes we're going to do to get them the kind of variety that they need so that the gameplay does not come off as too repetitive. Now they need those multiple takes, sometimes they need a lot of variations just kind of on one beat or one acting motion or acting beat. But um, they need, uh, you need to make sure that they get that, but sometimes they'll just say, yeah, just give me, um, just that, that was great, now can we just have three more? Uh, maybe, but I wanna make sure that you get everything that you need for this session and um, starting to feel a little bit of strain here. And so if, we, if, if you have it, if you have what you need, if we don't, let's absolutely do it. But if you've got what you need, how about if we just, instead of three takes, we do two takes? This, this, with this kind of heavier part here. Would that be enough? Would that get you what you need? And often they, they can see that. Again, if you frame it as, I want to get you what you want, what you need. That is our, that is our mutual goal here. And there, I mean, I, I've never had a person or a director say, no, I, I want you to scream like a dying Nazi that's being burned alive right now in the first 10 seconds of this session, and we're just gonna do it, and we're gonna do it all out, and I don't care if it, they're not gonna say that. They want to have what they need. And so it is up to you as the creative collaborative specialist that you are, that you were hired to be, to talk to them about this, to set this up, and to make sure that, that they're pacing it out properly. The other thing is to make sure with a, an engineer, sometimes you're working with a really good engineer mm -hmm. who is able to set those compressors just right, and you don't have to worry about it when suddenly you're, you know, in the script, it's all in caps with five exclamation points. You know, Thought clue on. phone, I think I'm gonna be yelling. But the engineer may not uh, be so sharp and so you might want to, before you do the take, let the engineer know this is gonna be loud. 
perfectly fine to give them a little bit of heads up. You're also working the mic on your own as well, but you're collaborating also with the engineer and the sound people to make sure that they're getting the kind of, of, of performance sound that they need as well. Again, you're taking an active role in this. This is the way that I see it, is that you need to see that you are an active participant, a collaborator in getting them what they need. So that's uh, how I see it. The same thing in motion capture, um, because uh, a lot of the time you're dealing with animators who are finally getting to step away from their computer and deal with real life humans and they get giddy and they get super excited and they want you to do a bunch of different takes because you are their brand new toy. And it's super fun and you get the contagious, right? It's very contagious to have someone so excited to get to want to play with you and be so grateful with when you get what's in their head and you want to feed off of that. But you definitely need, in the same way, you need to be able to say, all right, <laughs> how many times do you want me to do this? Because there, there was one game I was working on and I had to get tackled by a large, I guess I probably shouldn't say, a thing. Um, <laughs> NDAs, two times respect your NDAs, back, you guys. Two That's times also sideways, two times uh, from the front, and then two times from the side. And I had to do it each time with um, 24 different weapons. So I started doing the math and I died, because um, you have to get hit to the ground. I died something about 400 times. And we were about halfway through, and the animators are like, mm, we need a bigger reaction. Hit her harder, because it was this big dude who was like six, seven, who had a pad, who was slamming into me. And I was like, whoa, hold on, you want, what do you want? <laughs> what are you looking for? What's your end result? And they said, we need a bigger reaction from you. And I said, cool, so if you hit me harder, I'll react less, that's just physics. So if you need a bigger reaction, um, let me, tr you do what you've been doing, big guy, and I'll just react bigger. Um, and they were skeptical, but they let me show them and then they were like, oh, it's so much better. But, it, but they don't know, you know? And, and the other thing is, is they're used to watching something a million times to make sure everything is perfect, because that's their world. And they'll just zone in on it and watch it over and over to make sure every single thing is perfect, because they, that's their beautiful mind and how it works. You can't do that with human beings, because we don't get better with time. We get tired. So <laughs> it's, it's really important that you're having this conversation with them and expressing to them, I'm going to need five minutes. Can I have some water? Can you not hit me as hard? You know, just <laughs> you knock it off. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The um, point is, don't be afraid to speak up. You tapping the brakes is not is not messing things up. It's not weakness. This is your job. It's sustainability. It's, it's your job to help them get what they need. So you saying uh, maybe less or maybe more or not so much. That's you doing your job. What you need to do. You need to have the confidence in your own, the creative power that you bring to this project that it's okay to say no or less or can we take a break. That's you being a professional. Yeah. That is what they hired you for. This is what you are there to do. This is not something to just simply take one for the team and do whatever they tell you to do. Why? Because it's not gonna get them what they right. want. Yeah. If I, if I had listened and let that guy hit me harder, it's not even about the pain, although there was pain involved. It's, it's about the fact that I knew that that wasn't going to give them what they wanted. And we were going to continue doing it harder and harder and harder until finally someone went, hey, wait a minute, this isn't working. So if you know your business, and you do, that's why you're here. That's why you're, taking the, why you're here. That's why you're in the union. You've been doing this a while. Speak your mind and collaborate. Help it be even better. I think those are the moments when I've been most satisfied, actually, in games, either on a performance capture set or in a booth. I can think of examples is, is when I advocated for what I needed, either creatively or just safe, like physically. I was like, I think it'll work out. I think we'll get good results if you give me this, if you let me do it this way, if you let me have a take where I can struggle vocally, um, you know, even though there's someone else's dialogue, give me his silent take and I can struggle. Or, you know, if I, it's, I think you can frame it for them almost like in game terms. You're like, this is my health bar, dude. If I take one more chip damage, I'm done for the day. Like, you know, like I kind of can't. So I think there's, yeah, it just takes reframing. I think the, the sort of the idea of them, of yourself as a human being as opposed to an asset or something, just kind of reminding them that that's what it is. is, is it, that's when I've felt most proud of myself, actually, um, is when I've been able to do that. And it resulted in something that was better for the project. And they're always grateful. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. I just, just one more thing on this, because it, 
when you're trying to get traction in your career, when you're just yeah. getting started and you want to transition to the, ch the point in your life where you're putting bread on the table by doing this thing that you love, it's easy when you see that there is no parking spot for you, when you audition and audition and everyone says no, for you to buy into this image that you're kind of this unwanted servant, this unvalued person. And then if you're just lucky enough, somebody will hire you and just hopefully you'll do whatever they want. And I'm here to tell you that you, you make something. There is something valuable that you bring to this world because of what you make, because of the stories that you help to make. This, I cannot, I, I can't describe to you the kind of joy and connection and happiness that this brings to people. You can see this at a convention, but I want you to, to cultivate as hard as this is because it's, it, it seems like it's all lined against you, especially when you're starting out and trying to get going, but that you have a, a really valuable creative power that you are bringing to bear and to focus and that these people need and that frankly they're lucky to have and that you need to feel good about that to, to carry this power, this, this star power this creative energy that people want, that's a wonderful thing to have, a wonderful thing to bring. And even though it's difficult and you're working your way in and this is really hard work and there's all this rejection and everything seems against you, that you can get traction, that you can find more options, that you can grow in your versatility, in your range, in the options of things that you can do. It can all lead forward to lots of interesting, fun work that pays pays residuals even some of it. And so when you're doing this kind of work, whether you're auditioning for it or you get into a gig, I want you to feel good about it. I want you to bring that good feeling that you feel about yourself into the room because uh, frankly, they need that. They want that. They want that to help drive this awesome thing that they are trying to make. And that is what you bring. That's the wonderful thing that you bring that we all kind of band together on a union and, and hold together as this, this value that re, we reinforce for ourselves and for the whole group together. There's great strength and power to that. So you've I got think, it. Yeah, yeah, speaking. Yeah. I, I think that's, that was a narrative that came up a lot in, in the strike. If you don't know, we were on strike for a while um, trying to improve the contract, the interactive contract. And there was a lot of discussion around, you know, everyone, people who love games want to do game voiceover. Everyone wants to do game voiceover. There's people waiting to replace you and kind of putting you in this devalued state. What you're doing is finding out now that it's actually extremely specialized. Not everyone can do it. It's hard and esoteric and bizarre. It, you're gonna, we're going to get to, like, sort of what to expect from sessions. It's, like... It's pure imagination with all, uh, the, as little context as you get in any kind of job. It's actually quite difficult, and that's I, I moved to Los Angeles with oodles of admiration and respect and curiosity about my favorite performers. So don't let someone tell you that anyone can do this. They cannot. Um, have You are doing exactly what you should do. You're educating yourself about what the work is like so that you go into the session prepared. You're going to offer something very special and, and very worth your worth time and money um, and respect from everyone you work with. So don't buy into the, the idea that anyone can do this. It's and not true. Have you heard that phrase, too green? They're too green. I didn't hire them because they were too green. I think those are people who have not realized what he just said. I think those are people who go in apologizing um, I think those are people who are afraid to speak their vision, speak their truth, collaborate, realize the power that they hold. This is not about being a diva. This is about knowing that you are the solution to their problem. Mm -hmm. And when you know that you are the solution and that your mind, no matter who else is up for it, you're the only one who can do it your way. When you know that, you're no longer too green. You're a professional. And you know you're a professional that you can do it unlike anyone else and you are the solution to the problem that they're trying to solve. So walk in knowing that and no one will ever call you too green again. I think it's, there's also, uh, there's a self-image problem for voice actors in general. I mean, even among our union, there's no voiceover award at the, the SAG After Awards, there's no voice acting award. And I think uh, some on-camera people don't even think that voice actors are really actors. There's, and there's a lot, I, I just think it's easy to buy into this kind of low self-esteem, 
status of what you do, but I'm, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that just some of the best actors you will find are, are people who are voice actors. There's nowhere to hide when you're standing behind that mic. And, and you've got to value that, even though the world may not. People Magazine or TMZ thankfully do not either. <laughs> we don't want their attention anyway. You just want to be good at creating stuff that you create. And, um, and again, just to value that uh, as a voice actor. So I want to, um, I think that's, I'm really glad we touched on that kind of self-valuation stuff. But I want to make sure that we cover other ways that you can go in as prepared as possible so that you have the information you need to do that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what the sessions consist of so you know how the flow is like. But also before we get too far away from the safety issue, I want to know what you guys do to warm up. I mean, for me, Before it's just in. a lot of stretching. Um, it, it, it's, it, there's training involved, depending on what you do. Just, you, you don't always just do stunts and motion capture. You can do cut scenes to the voiceover. Um, so, uh, but basically, just being warm and fluid in your body is the best way you can go. And then any kind of training you can have ahead of time. There's uh, motion cap capture classes popping up all over. Um, I, if you guys have any questions or want referrals, let me know, and I'll be happy to recommend some. Um, but basically, uh, just get in your body and figure out how to tell that story in your body. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there. I do like some light falsetto. That's some stuff I learned as a as a singing uh, in my singing classes with a really good teacher once upon a time. But I think as as much as anything, I think you should be healthy. I think you should be yeah. you should be getting enough sleep. You should eat well, and you should feel good. You should be, have a regular workout because this is athletic. This is, this is a workout to do this kind of stuff. Um, and for me, I'd actually, uh, more recently, I'd add meditation. That focuses my mind, and it's much easier to do a, a good, confident, relaxed job when your mind is clear. So those are just kind of general health things that a lot of people don't think about that. They get caught up in the rush of scrambling for it out here, and they don't take care of themselves. They don't get enough sleep. They don't eat right, and they don't work out regularly. Um, and I don't mean you know, like lifting weights and getting all buff and all that, but I mean like aerobically and, and just a variety of working out and just so that you feel healthy and strong and you bring that vitality to your performing. So the communication is in your body. So when you tell your body to do something, whether it's to speak a certain way or jump a certain way, it knows how to listen to you. I mean, you need to have that conversation going. Yeah, I, um, this is a funny anecdote for me. Maybe we'll find out if it's funny for you. But um, I, I was watching, I was playing Mass Effect, I think, 3, uh, and listening to Jennifer Hale. This is a thing that you'll be asked to do, right? Like a sprinting noise, like just a little bit of a... <laughs> Just like something that to run with um, and I remember having the thought like oh my god That's totally not what I sound like when I run like Jennifer Hale doing Commander Shepard I was like that's what a fit person sounds like when they run it was like mind-blowing and I was like huh And I happened to know Jennifer at that point and she's been she you know Downloaded a lot of wisdom and insight to me and I'm super grateful for that and she was like yeah Like what's your what's your exercise regimen? I was like, I don't got one I ate lots of great New York pizza and I play video games on my couch. And she was like get one so I um, have been using Zombies Run, which is a game for your phone. Uh, it's great. It's the only thing that's made a running reg like routine stick for me. It has zombies chase you. It's fantastic. Um, it's great. It's really great. I games hacked my life, and now I have a running routine, and I know what I can actually sprint a little bit. So and that survive was, a zombie apocalypse. And survive a zombie apocalypse. Important. Should they infest Bayona Creek, I will be fine. Um, yeah, so that was, yeah, being fit, being healthy, um, that was a big shift for me moving from New York to LA and like getting better sleep, drinking less, um, <laughs> running. Um, because you will, I think that's, it's easy to forget that for just voice, is, is you think about it maybe as a stunt thing, a fitness need, but, but for voice too, you need to be, if I'm underslept, I'm not processing context information. Like stuff comes at you in game sessions very quickly and you need to process context and offer variety very rapidly and you can move at a pretty good clip. So if you're distracted and tired and you're not like getting what you need to do or your mouth is a little gooey and you're, you're costing time. And you'll time. wear out faster. You'll wear out, um, you won't be productive, you won't be present. So take care of yourself, you can hear it, you can feel it, it it's meaningful. So, so I, for me, when I warm up, I do a thing called um, straw phonation, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but you, I use a little coffee. Straws are like verboten now. <laughs> Straws are bad. But I, 
I bought straws before they were bad. Throwing them away is bad. Yes. You're keeping I it. I save them all. Like a <laughs> <laughs> Hoarding straws is good. That's, Hoarding straws is good to hoard is straws. Great. Um, just, um, yeah. Um, Howard Hughes over here with straws. So, um, no, I have a coffee stirrer straw. It's very small. The smaller, the better. And you kind of buzz it like a kazoo. So when I'm driving to a session, um, I will. I have a karaoke playlist of my favorite songs that I know the words to. I just run it for hopefully 15 minutes or more, and I will buzz um, the straw like a like a kazoo um, for some portion of that time. Try and stretch out, do exaggerate my mouth movements so my mouth is warm and my face is warm as well. But the straw foundation is great because it's very gentle and it vibrates back on your cords, on your vocal cords, and kind of gets them warm without exerting at all. So it's like a very low stress but very effective way to kind of warm up your instrument and you'll arrive a little warmer. So you're, you're, you're playing a straw? I'm like <laughs> Yeah. That kind of thing? Like yeah. In tune with like, you know, whatever. Beck or something. Yeah. I'd love to York. see what this looks like. I've never... It looks silly. <laughs> it looks silly, but it's great. Right. And that's actually something that was recommended. I picked that up from the... SAG. SAG is offering all kinds of good for you guys for being here because they're offering information sessions and they're passing this info back to you. I learned that from the vocal stress session from, right from a doctor that said that it was like one of the more effective things they'd seen. So um, keep coming to these and you'll, you'll have an advantage over other people going out for this stuff. So that's safety showing up, which is cool. If you show up in a mocap set and they want you to do a stunt and you don't feel comfortable or you are not told ahead of time, you can totally pull the plug. Um, I would call a SAG rep and let them know. Um, there is something in the contract that I don't want to misinform. Yeah. yeah, but there, there is something in terms of if you do feel comfortable with doing it but they hadn't told you ahead of time, there might be some sort of an adjustment in there. Normally there's not stunt adjustments, but in that particular case, if you haven't been warned. So just don't ever do anything you feel unsafe doing. Um, there was an, a voiceover actor I know who was shown up on set and he, they had to hang him. And he was like, oh no, that's not happening. <laughs> You did not tell me, and that's an ro actual rope. You did not figure out a rig. So don't be afraid to say no. Um, they can easily... The, the cool thing about motion capture is that um, it's, it's not a whole set. I mean, it's, you're in a big empty room. I don't know if you guys know yeah, we can, what this Let's happens. get to what happens at a job, yeah. so let's do that. Yeah, so it's a big empty room, and there's a Peak grid all the way capture. around it with usually about 35 to 40 cameras po pointing at you, and that's it. So if they need to move a scene from today to tomorrow because you don't feel comfortable being hung, that's no problem to them. I mean, there's a little bit of a scheduling issue, but it's not the same as when you show up on a set and there is a crew of 150 people and there's a lighting setup and there's wardrobe and there's we're on this set today and that set tomorrow and it's a real big problem. If you don't feel comfortable, you can say, I don't feel comfortable, and they'll just bump to the next day and have someone else do it in a diff with a different body. So do not hesitate saying you don't feel comfortable. It, it's no skin off their back to do it. If you want to postpone the beheading another day, <laughs> it's cool. I get if one you'd rather be hung tomorrow, you, guys, cool. you know, if you have a date that night ever. and you want to wait. Um, so, so there's no pressure for you to do that. I understand that if you should still never do it when you show up on a regular set and you don't feel comfortable, but there's even less pressure on a mocap set because there's so much more fluid. You have a bunch of apple boxes and that's a giant. And you have, you know, like there's no actual set, there's no wardrobe, um, there's nothing like that that would tie them up in their work schedule. So always speak up if you don't feel comfortable. So let's, I mean, I, I wanna finish again, coming back to what we started with was how to get these jobs, but I think it's, I think it's important for you to feel ready if you get them to like just go in and crush. So yeah, and, just and for moving. motion capture, it's also completely, there nobody knows how to get these jobs. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah, we'll definitely circle back to it. I promise. But we're on the subject now and I think that's the most powerful thing you can do is show up ready to go. So for me, um, we'll talk about performance capture. We'll talk about the, the volume. So I, the best way that I, I, I've done one job now, Anthem was performance capture. Um, that was a, like two years of on and off of stuff. So it's my one job, but it was a fair number of days. The best way, I walked in feeling um, pretty uh, prepared, actually, surprisingly. I, I had a theater background. I had a dance background. Make sure your agent knows those things. Ideally, you will have some kind of mocap reel or on-camera reel. I'm really lucky I got this job despite not having footage to view, but I had those skills in my favor. But watching behind the scenes, you can find on YouTube BTS behind the scenes footage from game shoots and kind of get a sense of what it looks like. It's, you're in a weird suit. Your hands feel funny because they're all taped really you know, individually. 
you have a camera right here. So I mean, just sort of the best thing I did was just pre-visualize what that would feel like to be on that set. It's very empty. There's apple boxes that have to represent major pieces of set to you. You have you know a couple other actors with you. Um, but sort of putting yourself in that headspace, you can do, you can get that insight by watching YouTube. Um, so you come in, you've got, you get in your suit, you have someone to wrap your hands, communicate about your hands. That was a big, just a little, tiny little tip for me. I was like, oh, it feels fine. It's great. It's not too tight because I was eager to please. It's going to feel tighter by the end of the day. So just flex, be honest about that. Be honest about how it feels. Um, yeah, and then you have dots on your face. The camera is very close. It can be kind of strange. There's a bright light, things like that. Um, what else kind of might throw you off when you show up or what else do you... I mean, it's a spandex suit, it's a spandex so there's suit. not much to hide. Again, coming back to the running regimen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can wear like bi uh, biker shorts or a tank top underneath if you want to. I recommend it. Those stages are usually pretty cold. Um, and uh, usually the, hel the helmets, depending on where which stage you work on, there's one particular stage where the helmets are torture. Tight, really but tight. But for the most part, they're really comfortable. It's just a strange thing, especially if you're having an intimate scene yes. with someone and you're clanking cameras. Hitting camera and kissing. Yeah. That's a big one. Um, but that's the main thing. You're in a spandex suit. Um, you've got uh, reflective balls at all your joints um, so that they can mark the movement of your skeleton. Um, it, something that's weird is usually you're not playing the size of the character you actually are. So um, I worked on something recently where I was playing a 10-year-old. I'm 5'9", and I was playing a 10-year-old, and all the adults were shorter than me. And so all my conversations were up like this. <laughs> trying to talk to people who are right here looking at my belly button <laughs> for scale. So there's, there's just some weird stuff that you just have to think of physically because if you're playing um, some huge dragon character and you're having a conversation with a little human, uh, it, there's different scales and, and things like that. But they, they usually walk you through it or they'll give you yeah. a piece of tape to talk to you and, and mm -hmm. all of that. But the coolest yeah. thing, and it's very similar to voiceover in this regard, is it's all in your head. Yeah. Like it's beautiful. You get to build this entire world and fill it out in your head, which is wonderful and a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, because you, they'll usually they'll guide you through it, but if they don't, you have to flesh out this world all in your head, and you have to come up with these moments that make it feel real and not get distracted by all the technical aspects. It, it's That's interesting true. as you describe this because I'm really not familiar with with that realm, um, but that the the key to it is is very similar to me to the I key to say. regular. Yeah. Uh, animation voice acting, for instance, because it it, it it feels to me like I'm seeing it as we're performing it, and that as I change my performance or add seasoning to the performance, I'm adding to the final animation that's playing in my mind. And in order, it sounds to me, to do that with motion capture, it's very similar, where you have to be that specific about the environment that you are creating with your imagination and your and your performance. I think we'll get into some of the differences with other kinds of jobs, both non-voiceover and within voiceover. But that's the if you if you take one thing, another one thing. I probably already said that. Or <laughs> one thing, D's website. Second thing, um, imagination. This is like the most imagination-heavy kind of work you can do. You're going to get less context cues, artwork, scene partners sometimes. So coming in being ready to be your own scene partner, coming in be ready to imagine the space in great detail around you. I think it's it's as much like being a kid on a playground as you can get in acting. Um, so being ready to kind of be your full kid self. Um, improv is a great training. If any of you guys have improv experience, um, just being that that ready and responsive and spontaneous and full of imagination, that's the single biggest asset you can bring to either performance capture or game voiceover, I think. Um, yeah, just to, I mean, to me, ultimately, one of the ultimate answers to any question that a an actor can have is is just make yourself better. Make yourself so good that they have to hire you. Make yourself so compelling and interesting and full of things that you love uh, and of, of the, the, the database of, 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 of storytelling that, uh, that you, you see in books and movies and television that, that, you, that you are constantly filling yourself with these resources as an artist, as an actor, and that you're, you're, you're on this process of living your life, not just being an actor, but you're living a life, and, and as, as you're doing that, you're kind of weaponizing the abilities that you have, these, these special skills and, and, and special ops things that you can do that you bring to your session. 
the better an actor that you make of yourself, the more of any kind of work will, will start coming your way. Let's talk a little about the booth then, what it's like to put yourself in the booth and imagine being in the booth for a game-specific job. So you show up, you're less likely to have a scene partner than in animation. In animation, my impression is lots more ensemble reads. Um, so by yourself, probably. You may or may not have the other half of the conversation to work with. Um, and workflow, how does that look like for you? Yes, well, it's typically a solitary gig. You're by yourself. And uh, it's, 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 it's similar to auditioning, which is typically a lonely mission as well, which is, I think, the most difficult thing that a voice actor can do, is to audition on your own, to direct yourself. That's the hardest thing in the world to do, that any of us are asked to do. If you're in there with a room with others, and you're collaborating with your, with your cast and all that, getting that performance out so it sounds right and fits right, it's way easier. But if you're by yourself before the show's even made, that's, that's really difficult stuff to do. And um, you're not given a script ahead of time, right? And, and right. Or even the entire script. You're usually just given the, your lines. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And so, I mean, when the audition comes down the pike, it's up to you to kind of, because you're familiar with video games and, you know, and how acting works out and maybe recent successful movies that maybe this game refers to, or maybe uh, recent hot actors that are, are really uh, on everyone's lips that they're actually trying to portray here. You can see it's like, this is actually Christoph Waltz is who this is. This is, this is what they want. To be able to, to know these things so you can dial that in and solve what they want uh, in the performance, but also in the tone and in the pace because you've got to kind of hit all of that in order for them to say yes, call back, or yes, book in the gig. If it's too fast, if it's too cartoony, if it sounds like it's on a different kind of a show or a different kind of a game, it's not going to do it. So the more you know about these games and these kinds of games or the sources that feed this kind of a story, like Blizzard, how about Shakespeare? How do you know, how, how, how do you know about... What do you know about Shakespeare and the Bard and all those different kinds of shows? Because there's a lot of stuff going on there that's very... Shakespearean? It's very Shakespearean. That's yeah. fun. Um, but, but these are things that you bring uh, to the audition and then ultimately to the, to the session as well. You walk into the session, it's going to be you. Um, you look over the contract, which is, is going to be very long and detailed. Hopefully your agent is giving you a heads up and your agent is giving a good look over this contract so that you know what's coming down the pike. Then... You talk with the engineer and the creative decision maker. Hopefully there's as few of those as possible. The mm. more of those there are, the <laughs> slower the session goes and it's not good. But that's out of your control. The only thing is that you worry about is what's within your control. And so you kind of map out how the session's gonna go so they can get everything that they need and you space out the work so that they can do that. And then off you go. If you're feeling fatigued, if you need some tea, if you need to take a break, you ask for it. Why? This is how you get them what they want, so you're not burning yourself out. And so you move through it, and, uh, and hopefully you're going to give them something that's better than what they thought, quicker than they thought they were going to get it. That's, the, uh, that's, the, that's what you're shooting for. I think the, um, yeah, so as, as far as what to expect when you're in there, um, it's different. For so performance capture, you will get your script. You'll need to be off book. You can't have a script. And you'll get to have people, people to react to. It's a joy. It's the best. For the booth version, you won't get the script with very few exceptions. It will be cold reading. That, is, that will be final use. What you read cold you is going to be... You don't even know what game it is. Right, you don't get to know what game it is. I didn't know what Final Fantasy was, they wouldn't tell me, when I was in there on the session. And these things, like, it's... Speaking of touchstones, it does behoove you to know the cultural touchstones or the game franchise. If they're willing to tell you what it is, um, then you suddenly have worlds of information about the tone that you're trying to step into. To me, when you know. stepping into it, it's... I don't... I don't really have much of an option, nor do I really want to show up prepared. I want to show up ready. Flexible, I want to show up ready to do whatever yeah. strikes them and be able to read through those lines. I read a lot on my Kindle out loud so that I have grasp and control of, of long form language so that's not tripping me up and that makes the process more efficient. That also helps too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you get there, you will re you'll see, sometimes if you have paper scripts, you can skip ahead and kind of get a sense of what all you're covering in that day or what the rest of the conversation is. Other games use proprietary systems where you're only seeing a digital screen one thing at a time. You can't do that. You can't kind of get a map just on your own quickly. Um, you'll do lines either one or two or three in a row usually. So again, with that improv thing, feeling ready, you can't get locked to the, your interpretation of a line delivery the way you can when you try and set it in theater. That's not gonna fly. So I mean, even marking up your script with breaths and beats and things is great work in theater. It's you can't you use it once and then you need to find another way of tackling the line. So be ready to be to be flexible, spontaneous, to see and hear lines very differently immediately. Also, because you usually don't know the context. Mm -hmm. It's usually just a, just a screen of lines yeah. with no context. Sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they won't. And you can ask. You can say, like, how far away? I do that all the time. Like, how far away is my scene partner? Am I yelling? Is it a loud battlefield? Is it quiet? What's going on? You can ask those things. And they what was just said know. to me? Yeah. What was just said to me? What was my moment before? Because often you're given a, le a list of lines, and it's yeah. like, well, I can just say it, but you don't want it generic. Yeah. You want it specific. I mean, the easiest thing in the world is to make a really generic game or a really generic superhero show or whatever. And that's not what we want to deliver. We want to deliver something that is authentic and living and fresh. And to do that, you need to know where it came from and, and all the specifics around it. So ask for those, whatever is helpful. What's my relationship to this character? Am I yes. dating them? Are they my brother? Those would be different. What's my status? Things. What's my age? What's yeah. the action here? So be ready to, and, and feel free to ask those questions. Also be prepared if they don't have answers. So give your best guess, build a guess, like just build out of nothing, kind of like a version of it. Don't be lost if they can't answer those things, but they will probably be happy to answer them for you if they know. So yeah, so two or three in a row, doing a run. Sometimes you'll get sets of, act, like you know, the way that they handle combat can vary. Sometimes you will have the benefit of, like for example on For Honor, I got to see the, the mocap sessions, or I got to see animations for every single attack. So it was e very easy for me, it was almost reactive to me to, um, to know how big of an axe swing this is. Because I could see it was really heavy. It was like, <clears throat> you know, like really a lot of effort. Or I could see if it was small. Sometimes you won't have that. Sometimes you won't have the reference footage to look at. They'll just be like, give us five different axe swings. And, okay. and even if it's only an effort sound like that, that they say, okay, give it to me three times. What they do not mean is, ugh, ugh, yeah. ugh. No, right. they Variety. want three different ways. You can simply add a different, you can make it a different vowel if you want. Ugh. Ah. Ugh. Switch up the vowel, but so that it's the same event, the same action, but there's variety. That's yeah. what they or want. small, medium, large, small, too, medium, large. so that they know like how much of an effort where you are in your battle. That's the big thing I think that, um, I think a lot of actors who come from other contexts might be a place of inhibition that, that game voice actors have lost at that point. You can't come in nervous about making big weird noises with your butt, you know, you know, like you can't, you don't have time. So you need to feel free and playful and unembarrassed about making really goofy, vulnerable noises at full freedom in the booth. So kind of practicing that. I do a lot of parroting games. I'll play games and I'll parrot efforts or lines or whatever back at them just so I get in that habit of feeling free and un, you know, just unashamed. <laughs> um, but that's something to be ready to do um, you know, really quickly and freely. Um, so yeah, that's like a, that's a traditional game voice session. Anything else that we're... Yeah, it's yeah. A, you're running down a page sure. and it's just a list of, of uh, lines and maybe one or two takes for each line running down the page and then maybe do a spot uh, fix before you move on to the next and you work through your session that way. Yeah, um, for motion capture there will be several different types of uh, capture sessions you will have. So there's performance capture where you are acting and um, they're capturing your face and your body at the same time. Those are usually the cut scenes um, for those of you who don't play video games, those are the times when the gameplay stops and uh, information about the story is relayed. So it's more like a cinematic movie. <clears throat> um, and sometimes you do that as performance capture and sometimes they've already recorded the voiceover and you're just doing the body. And those are usually pretty laid back, talking heads, finding a way to make that interesting and do interesting dynamic blocking. That's what, that's what your job is for that. Um, and so, uh, then there's um, the in-game stuff, which is just the worst. Um, but you'll get to do it. Uh, and the in-game stuff is everything your character is doing when you're playing them. 
So you have to capture all the running, the jumping, the falling, the dying, that's all that dying I did. The crouch runs, you have to do a crouch run for miles. Um, You'll get electrocuted. And you get electrocuted too. electrocutions are fun. Yeah, those are real, because they actually use real electric. Yeah. Just like really hanging you, yeah, right. There's like a there's a taser. Um, I remember the first time I did in game. I was in the best shape of my life, and I was actually throwing up within two hours um, because I wasn't pacing myself because I didn't know what it was. But also, it's intense. You have to be in the best shape ever to be able to do this. Um, and then there will be fight sequences and fight scenes. Which if you're in stunts, you'll be doing that. If you're not in stunts, don't worry about it. Usually they're incorporated somehow in a cutscene, but sometimes they're just standalone because they want to do something really cool. Um, and so that's how they'll separate the days. They'll have your cutscenes, which is the, dr the drama, talking head stuff. You'll have your in-game stuff, which again is usually stunt people. And then you'll have your stunt stuff, which is wire rigs and jumping off of things and all your fight sequences. So those are your three different days that you can expect. I want to, one last feature of game unique stuff that I think Dee is uniquely positioned to speak to is creature stuff. Mm -hmm. Dee is a legend in creature voiceover, and I'd just love to know if there's anything else you recommend about finding, accessing different parts of your instrument to use in creatures, or how you approach well, their psychology. Well, it, uh, it, 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 um, I, I do that kind of stuff because I like monsters and animals, and um, I, I really, and I'm also, I've had a lot of improv, uh, and it's a very improvisational, um, specialty, I guess you'd call it. But fundamentally, I, I don't see myself as a sound effects guy. And, and, and some of us, you know, are brought in to do the weird, you know, zombies and monsters and animals. And um, if you, the first thing you want to do is not think of it as a sound effect. You're thinking of it as a acting. It's, it's specific acting. They need to have an actor because there's intent and it connects into the story and you're telling a story. So for instance, you know, if it's, if it's a monster, you're not just making monster sounds, but there, it's going through action. It's you know, it's it's curious. It's alert. It's alerted. It's taking damage. It's menacing. It's 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 no different from any other kind of acting gig. So, for me, if you're interested in doing that, um, you have to have improvisational experience. I myself just drove around listening to animal tapes and imitating them. Our, our CDs at the time in the car and just building up a vocabulary, starting with, you know, the inhale with the, like the pig, the <laughs> which, which can, <laughs> you find ways to modify the sound. Yeah, yeah, it feels good. Hooray. And that's with the inhale stuff, and you just, you play with it. You, you play with it, you push it out, you, 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 you get new little ornaments and things that you can put on the shelf and save for another day. Uh, you, can, you can work with your soft palate, and that's still with the inhale, and then you go with the exhale. The, how can I do this without tearing up my throat? Instead of going, ah, can I go, like that? Can I do that w without, without hurting myself, but with making this sound that's just like, holy crap, you know? And, but, but something that's expressive, that's not just a sound. It can go. That. That's something that they can animate to. It's no different from if you're speaking words. It's, it's the same to me. Um, whether it's that or you know, a little creature, you know, way up there, the high stuff. It, there's, there's all kinds of parts of your, of your face and your, your, your head and your neck and your throat that's not just your vocal cords, but that's available <laughs> uh, that you can pick up and mess with and, and add to the others and, and so well anyway I'm, I've really just kind of <laughs> I've kind of hijacked wonderful. this show haven't it's I? It's absolutely Sorry. wonderful thank you Dee thank uh, God you did look at me look at me look at the show off um, but, but, but what I'm doing there is no different than if you're you know the evil king or the hero or the lost waif or the zombie it, it, it's all really the same. It comes from a specific performance that serves the story and is telling the story with very specific intent.
That's what we are hired to bring. And I think that's um, that's something to carry over into non to also apply. Remember to apply to non creature effort stuff. A lot of people sort of talk about, but also just yay, thank you, D. <laughs> so good, so good. Um, but that intention and that acting and the discovery, having your instrument be something you're deeply familiar with and curious about and have fun with, and that you um, utilize in a way that doesn't hurt you. Doesn't hurt you. That that's the important thing is mm -hmm. you're not hurting yourself when you're doing this. Not hurting yourself and using it to convey intention and emotion. I mean, I think that's something a lot of uh, actors who come in and are really put off by the effort stuff and the combat stuff see it as this extra special skill that's sort of instrumentalized and kind of like divorced from the character that they want to play. And that's a mistake. I, I've gone in, I've, I'm doing a job that uh, came in and I had cut scenes a certain way and that was fine. And then I discovered who she was in this crazy long combat set of chainsaws and you know sh big shotguns and whatever. And like who, who a character is under stress is extremely revealing and exciting. I mean, who, like it gets to the core of kind of who you are in a stress moment, in a panic moment, in an emergency, in a way that's really direct and kind of thrilling. So take advantage of that. Is this a, is this a seasoned military person that they have a kind of resolve and they take damage a certain way? Um, if, are they a terrified civilian? That's a whole other world of emotions and physical reactions and preparedness for what's happening. So don't, don't throw that away. When you get to the combat stuff and the effort stuff and the, the embodied stuff in the space, it's not a lack of character. It's another opportunity and a place to discover new things and another place to play. I would also throw in that I think like if there's like a yell or a scream or so, even a scream is, um, uh, and as I said, I was lucky to have a good singing teacher that helped me, is I think of it as a kind of controlled singing, that I'm placing it in a way that is relaxed and powerful. If you've had singing training or voice training, you know what I'm talking about, that you, that you, you make it with the least amount of effort, but you get the most amount of power. And that's really what you want if you're if you're doing the ah or the uh, ah yeah yeah ah ah hey ah oh, ah it's 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 making a big loud sound. It's like a child, an infant. They're 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 they'll make the they're, they're the best. They're the masters. They're the ninjas. They can make a sound that will cut through a building yeah. <laughs> because it's relaxed. Yeah. It's relaxed and is placed just right in this way that's not hurting their voice. Little babies, <laughs> they don't get vocal nodes <laughs> because they're doing it right. And so uh, if it helps and if, you're, if you find yourself guided towards that way that maybe some good singing instruction will help you find the way, it's kind of like riding a bicycle, is that once you find the way to place that, then you don't have to work so hard to get that kind of power out in your performance. And becoming really good at that is really helpful for you in two ways. One, if you're doing solely the voice, then the person who's doing your motion capture can hear that levels and augment your performance with what they're doing physically because they're hearing it. We've gotten voiceover from celebrities who are not voiceover actors because it's a completely different skill and they are flat and boring. And I'd love to hear that. Uh, <laughs> I Some just love good. stories it's, about how difficult famous people are to work skill. with. I mean, well, they've, I made a, they've made a career of what's happening in their face, not what's happening in their voice, and so they're recording the voice because that's their character, but it's just boring. And yet what they're doing and the words they're saying is like very animated, possessed by a symbiote thing, and you're trying to figure out how to, how to do the motion capture that's supposed to tell the story that doesn't quite match the voice. Okay. And so that's an interesting that's that's an interesting thing. So so being able to do what he said because I've motion captured creatures and you can tell the difference when it's just noises for the sake of noises and you can tell when it's there's a story being told here. But the other thing is is becoming proficient at it and being able to do it because when you're doing performance capture and you can speak to this, it's like patting your head and your stomach at the same time because it's two different skills. Voiceover is a different skill and moving your body is a different skill and a lot of people can't walk and talk. And that's fine, because it's actually harder than you realize. But if you become really, really good and you're practicing in your car all the time and you have this wide range that you can do the voice without thinking, then you can concentrate on the body. Or if you become really, really great with your body so that you can do the body without thinking, because usually you're not gonna be walking like yourself, you'll be walking like the character, then you could do the concentrate on the voice and make the voice different than you. So the more practice and training you can do to add all these different levels, 100% benefits you. 
The enemy is tension. So, the, I mean, that's just, I'm just kind of reducing what they've just said into one thing is what you, there's a tendency to kind of hold tension to create the sound of pain or, or stress in your instrument, and you actually do not want that. So find, play with things until you're not gripping your own vocal cords to try and sound like you're in pain because that will be damage. So that's, that's the kind of paradox of that, is that like what you think might sound like damage you can't do sustainably. So uh, the more relaxed you are, yeah. the more free you are. You kind of throw it off. The better it will I sound. Mean, you see Itzhak Perlman playing the violin, and he's not like this, you know? <laughs> it's just the easiest thing in the world. Or riding a bicycle. It's like you're, you know, when you start, you're like this, and it's this really hard thing. But when you're doing it, it's just easy. Yeah. You just, much, much, much less effort. And that comes with training. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so we're almost out of time. I want to open it up to questions soon. Um, I did say we would get back a little bit to how you get these jobs. So now that you're prepared to do them and you're prepared to audition, because I, th I think you're prepared to audition based on the format and knowing what's required, um, do you need, this is the last question I think I'm going to ask before we do that, is just do you need an interactive reel or uh, headshots or anything? I think it helps um, from the performance caption, motion capture stage. I, th I think uh, video games are getting more and more um, naturalistic and they're getting more and more actor centric and they just want good performances. So I think what they would want to see, in fact, I know for a fact what they want to see is just that you know how to move your body like a person. I mean, that's that's the main thing. Um, if you wanted to just go shoot some footage of you acting like a creature, or this is my superhero walk, this is my villain walk, this is, I mean, that is helpful because then they can see that you know how to move. But they don't require now that you have tons of experience, especially for the title characters. They want just good actors who know how to live in their body. Because like I said, it's actually really hard to find people who can walk and talk. So if your reel shows that you can do that, I've, I've been hired by this one specific casting director to come and work with actors at their audition because they're excellent on camera or voiceover, but they haven't quite figured out how to show that in their body and get comfortable in their own skin. And so as long as you have tape that shows that, it doesn't need to be you in a video game, you don't have to be in a mocap suit. It just needs to show, hey, look, I can move my body, I can dance, I can um, take on different character types, you know, and that's the main thing that they're looking for. And that's what they'll ask for you in your auditions when you go in for these things. They wanna make sure you can act, but they wanna make sure you can move. Now don't overdo it. It's not like, oh, I'm late, I have to go. Like you don't mime it out. <laughs> Just, just be a person. That's all they're looking for is that you can be a real person like you would in a normal conversation and not freeze up um, and just focus on your face. Because a lot of auditions for on camera, right, they tell you hold your sides, don't move your body, and just, you know, you can't do that. You have to, the more off book you are, the more you can actually just be in the moment. That's what they're looking for. Um, one way to think about integrating the, the patting your head and rubbing your tummy um, in a way that I hope will make sense, and was told to me by Amy Hennig. Amy Hennig was very sweet about mapping out what, to me, a long time ago, about like what, without, before hiring me, she was just nice. Uh, I don't know. But, um, she like, is just she's nice. So Uncharted. Nice. She directed Uncharted, Uncharted one yeah. and two. Um, right. she, and she and sort of set this watermark for a collaborative way of working with actors that I think we're all still, the rest of the industry is kind of beginning to implement or catch up with. Um, but she said, the, they look for theater experience, but not like Broadway, like intimate theater. So if you think of it as like a small theater in the round, it's it's slightly heightened gesturally so that it plays to everybody that's there, but you don't have to project to fill a house. You're not like, you know, it's not, you're not cheating out. It's not that. But like theater, intimate theater in a round, gentle on your voice, imagine they can hear you no matter what you're saying. That That's one way to kind of start to make that coordination kind of integrate, I think, is how I thought about it. And it made sense to me. So they look for that too. Just be a person. Just be human. That's what they're looking for. When you're having conversation with another human being, you're going to act differently than if you're doing sides with someone. They want to just make sure that you can act like a human being. Um, so yeah, and then for an interactive reel, do you have an interactive voice reel? No, I don't. Um, I, I think um, uh, if you're, if you're at a, an agent who gets the calls and they know that you want to do this kind of work, they'll probably send the auditions your way. And then um, in my case, uh, well, the creature stuff, that's a different thing. But in terms of like, uh, if you've got an animation reel where that kind of tone is covered, 
that might not be a bad thing until the casting people of this particular game company know you. Uh, so it couldn't hurt. I, I do. I have one. I um, Because what they will do otherwise, usually, is they'll have your maybe your commercial reel and your animation reel. And they'll kind of triangulate. Because again, it's not as, depending on the kind of game, it's not quite as heightened and stylized as cartoons. They're listening for sounding like a real person in conversation with other real people. So that kind of read tends to come up more in commercials. So they might listen to your commercial reel and then listen to your animation reel to make sure you can embody characters and people with different perspectives. Um, but I found that, it, I don't know that it's industry standard yet, but I have an interactive reel that's now finally cut together from actual jobs. Yay. Um, so, and that kind of covers the, the range of like natural, things that are natural humans that are in my range, but kind of spread. I mean, I have a Viking raider who's like built, that's the fun part about games is that I get to play, I'm like a tiny weird pixie and then I get to play huge brick poop house Viking people. Um, so she's down and gruff and then I have like young teens and whatever. So, but, but that's the keystone is that it's fairly natural. So if you have that covered in your animation reel, that's great. If you want to put together an interactive reel, I think that shows a lot of initiative and, and kind of speaks directly to the kind of sounds they're listening for. So I would recommend it. I to don't me, in, in doing that, I'm very targeted. I mean, for an animation reel, uh, I'll have bits where this, this bit is for a Fox animated sitcom. This is for a Disney preschool show. This is for a Cartoon Network sort of uh, Adventure Time knockoff. I'm that specific in tone and target for each little bit. None of them sounds like the others, and none of them has the same tone or energy as the others whatsoever. And if I were putting together uh, an interactive reel, I would do the same. I would say, here's my Gears of War, here's my uh, banjo kazooie here's my you know and so you you cover all these different bases of the kind of games that you think you'd want to work on mm -hmm. that's a great touch because there's great power and hope that we do this together as voice actors we work the minimum contract the basic scale contract that brings us and binds us all together and so your attention to your craft and your art as well as showing up to the, to the union events and maybe even becoming involved. I've got to say, I, I've, I didn't want to do that, but it's really valuable because this contract is the one that we work. This is the professional path forward. And your involvement, that's the strength of it. It's no stronger than your involvement. So thanks very much to everybody. I, yeah, I came here five years ago and I didn't know anything and I started coming to stuff like this and I found that because I loved games and had relationships with the developers, there was room for my contribution and my voice. So don't stay, do not feel alienated from your union. Your union consists of you. It is a community of, of people like you who care about it, who want to make it the union itself the best it can be, who want to make the work the best it can be. So don't see it as something separate from yourself. Keep showing up and stay, stay connected. Mm -hmm.